Good morning. Good mo good morning. Good good morning. I'm told we're live. I'm looking here. I don't see it yet. Just came up. All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good year. All right. I'll let you start. Well, with that positive thought in mind that it's going to be a good year, let's rise and let's join and greeting this new year. God, you're a shield about me through that last year and this. Thou, Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. Thou, Lord, are a shield you're my glory, you're the lifter of my head. Hallelujah, 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 you're the lifter of my head. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, you're the lifter of my head. Let's sing that again, shall we? Thou, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory, you're the lifter of my head. Thou, Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. Hallelujah. 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 You're the lifter. Hallelujah, 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 you're the lifter of my head. It's a good lesson to keep in mind. He's here with us. And pretty good lesson is to have his way, not yours. It always goes so much better. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am still waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence. Humbly I bow, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, wounded and weary, surely I pray, power, all power, surely is thine, touch me and heal me. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, 
Till all shall see Christ only always living in me. My hope for this new year is that Christ continues to live through all of you. You may be seated. Well, here we are, the first Sunday of 2022. We have a few announcements. Our Seats and Feats fundraiser, unless I hear from some of you today that you need another week, we'll go ahead another week. So um, next Sunday, we will be collecting all of the donated items and taking them to a Boise Rescue Mission for them to um, distribute as they see best. Men's Bible study is postponed and will resume January 27th, um, not the 29th. 27th is that Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, taking a, a short break while Roy heads to South America um, man camp, end of February. If you are a man, you should go. So see Roy for details. Um, <laughs> hmm? Hmm? I'm a man. <laughs> the man song. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful retreat. I personally have not experienced it, but I have heard um, through many of the men who attend, um, young men from younger than Javier all the way up to um, old. Uh, <laughs> whatever that is to you. 95, 100. Um, it is a, um, a wonderful time. It's a time of growth and restoration, a time where men can go and be vulnerable, which um, for a lot of men, it's a, um, a difficult place to put themselves in. And yet when it's a whole group of them doing that, anyway, if you want to hear more experiences from man camp, past man camp, um, talk to Roy, Antonio, Javier, um, they've attended many of them and can share with you about that. There are scholarships available, so do not let um, financial need be the reason you do not attend. Transportation um, help is available. Do not let transportation be the reason you do not attend. Um, in fact, if there's any reason you think you shouldn't attend, I can give you a reason that will counter that. You should go if you're a man. Um, we do have our Bible reading plan, if you would like that. This is one of many examples uh, that we have in the foyer. Um, you can read the whole Bible, just the New Testament. You could do the New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. You can make this your own. Um, if you like seeing it on paper and putting it in your Bible and checking it off and knowing what you've done and seeing it like this, this is a great option. If you prefer a device that you can choose what font you want, what version you want, maybe changing the version. Um, if you want a reminder to come up on your device that says you haven't read your Bible today, um, I can help you get that app as well, um, which is what I do. Um, I get an alert like at 10 o'clock at night if I haven't read my Bible, um, which I will let you know that's very few and far between that I'm getting those alerts now. I used to get them all the time. I don't know, it's done way before 10. So working on starting my day um, immersed in God's word. But anyway, this is just an option that we have made available uh, for our online family. If you would like um, the link to where I got this plan and would want to print your own, just put in the comments uh, Bible plan and we will get you that link. Um, if you need help selecting one or you want to do one with us, um, just write Bible plan and we'll be in touch about um, how we can help you with that. It is chilly this morning, very cold. Um, 
Sue, what's the temperature there in Wasilla? I don't know if we have you beat or if that's a goal that we should have. Um, but it's like five degrees here. So it feels very cold, like my hands are still cold. Prayer requests and praises. So glad to see Charlene here this morning. Yay, that's the answer to prayer. We prayed for your vertigo last week. And here you are in person this week. Wonderful. Um, we'll remember to, play, to pray for Kara and her sleeping and lack of sleeping and the need for sleep and rest, to, wait, to wake well rested. Um, Brooke has surgery scheduled for Tuesday, so let's pray for Brooke and her uh, medical team as well as for Beth and Rob as the um, post-surgery is going to require lifting and caring for Brooke and so to pray for the whole family. Margaret is Betty's neighbor and she fell and broke her ankle in three places. So ouch, that just sounds like I just cringe thinking about it. And Roy um, had a little bit of change for his South America trip. We planned on him leaving tomorrow for Bolivia and Peru, and now it's postponed one whole week. He does not leave until next Monday, the 10th. Um, Peru's borders are closed. Um, very strict restrictions regarding um, things surrounding COVID, and, and so he will leave the 10th and only be going to Bolivia. So um, a praise that he still gets to go um, it's a bummer that he doesn't get to re reacquaint himself with his friends in Peru, but now he gets to meet new people in Bolivia. So let's pray for um, Ken Comfort and Dan Kamek as they are still leaving tomorrow and they will be going into Peru. So pray for them. The rest of the team will be leaving next Monday. Are there other prayer requests or praises? that I haven't mentioned. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that we can join together on this chilly January morning and gather together to worship you, to um, share our praises, to share our prayer requests. Um, God, we just lift this all up to you. We thank you for those here in person, for those joining us online. And Lord, we do just want to um, Thank you for just healing Shirley with her vertigo this past week. We pray for Kara and for Brooke, who's having surgery, for Margaret, who needs healing in her ankle. Uh, pray for the Luke 10 um, trip or the EFM group that's going down to South America. Give them traveling safety. Keep them healthy and well. And Lord, just pray for our church family for just the different areas that we're in. We continue to pray for Val. Be with her, Lord, um, just as she continues to um, navigate these waters of grief and mourning regarding Harvey's death. Uh, be with her, we pray. God, as we go into 2022, may we um, keep you as a priority. The songs that we've already sung this morning, Lord, we do want you to have your way with us. And whatever that is, um, thank you for our time together. Amen. I would like to have this hymn at the first of each year. Just a little, some good advice. Please rise and join us and yield not to temptation. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. Shun evil companions, 
bad language disdain God's name hold in reverence nor take it in vain be thoughtful and earnest kind hearted and true look ever to Jesus he'll carry you through ask the Savior to help you comfort strengthen and keep you he is willing to aid you he will carry you through now to him that o'ercometh God giveth a crown through faith we will conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Good words, all of them. Good advice. Sometimes you just need to lean back, accept the good advice, and then apply it to your life. Make me a servant, Lord. Zechariah, we are on the home stretch of our Minor Prophets series, going through all of these Minor Prophets, not because they are minor in any way except the length of the book in the Bible. That is what has made them um, earn the title Minor. Major means it's a long book, Minor means it's a short book. So going through all these Minor Prophets, um, hopefully to the best of our ability chronologically, so working our way through so we can see where things happen in the timeline um, in history. And, and so this morning uh, brings us to the end of our journey with Zechariah. Um, we've been immersing ourselves in this time of God's people who've returned from slavery in Babylon and they have found their homes in ruin. And um, they find their homes and their temple, their, their identity, their religion in ruins. And now they've been tasked with the need to rebuild. We've seen how God has come alongside them. 
He's encouraged them with strong and beautiful words of hope and strength and passionate love, calling them to a higher way of life, calling them to not despair, calling them to live out of the covenant God's made with them, calling them to holiness and purpose and hope. And we, too, have heard the same call to each of us. We've sang about it this morning. We are a different people in a different time, and yet we have so much in common. The voices competing for our attention and love, the challenges that only God can deal with. I think all of us could have a resounding amen to challenges that only God can deal with. We all have this deep need. Oh, one moment. Hey, we got a tissue in that one. Phew. Excuse me. Um, And a deep need to hear God say, My love for you is passionate and strong. We have hearts that cry out for justice in a broken world. And we all have this deep need for reassurance reassurance that God really is in control. That he really is good. That he really is involved in our lives and our concerns. We've talked about the last couple weeks how this apocalyptic literature this unique type of literature, it was very common in this time. This is where a story is told about this future day when a mighty God would fight a terrible battle and be victorious over all and every force of evil and will then um, usher in a new day where we'll have eternal joy and peace and goodness And the main point of this type of literature is always to encourage God's people that the day will come when all of this struggle and pain and evil will be dealt with forever. This is still extremely important to us as Christians, this longing for and the belief in a final day when God will fight, win, and restore. So when the writers of scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, when they wanted to communicate the truth to people of Zechariah's day, they did so with more drama and more flair and excitement and imagination and more vivid imagery than we typically use. And that was really what I got. Well, I got more than that. But this week reading Zechariah 14 was really how dramatic the writing is and and how vivid these images are. So if you will turn with me to Zechariah 14, this is at the very end of the Old Testament. So right We have one more book before we get into the New Testament. So if you go towards the New Testament, it is right before Malachi, right before Matthew. Zechariah 14. Listen to this imagery. It's so vivid. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations 
as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day, there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter. Then the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. The whole land from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, will become like the Araba. But Jerusalem will be raised up high from the Benjamin gate to the site of the first gate, to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hanel to the royal wine presses, and will remain in its place. It will be inhabited. Never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. This is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. On that day, people will be stricken by the Lord with great panic. They will seize each other by the hand and attack one another. Judah, too, will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the surrounding nations will be collected, great quantities of gold and silver and clothing. A similar plague will strike the horses and mules, the camels and donkeys, and all the animals in those camps. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will not have rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague he inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty, and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. Coming. Yeah. Martin Luther, a great theologian and reformer, wrote two commentaries about the book of Zechariah. In the first commentary, he ended after chapter 13 without explanation, leaving chapter 14 completely untouched. A year later, he wrote a second commentary and reportedly began his brief description of chapter 14 with these words. Here, in this chapter, I give up, for I am not sure what the prophet is talking about. I find that extremely comforting. <laughs> but let's slow down and walk through it together. My first pause is with a question. Is this is a deep heart cry question that comes out of the horror described in verses 1 and 2. This is where he's saying, um, a day the Lord is coming when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. 
And then he describes that the city will be captured, the houses ransacked, the women raped, half of the city will go into exile, the rest will not. So here's the question. Why does God wait until after all this horror to come and rescue? He does come. He does fight. He does win. But why does he wait until after the plundering, the destroying, the raping, the enslaving, the ruining? Why do his people have to suffer first? Why do we? God has a power that is infinitely clear. So why doesn't he have the timing? The question goes one deeper when we notice closely the very beginning of verse 2. I will gather. So it's not even a matter of God showing up late. The verse says God brings these nations who come and bring such pain on his people. I will gather them. We'll return to this question in a moment, but let's pause and explore what this tells us about God and about our worldview. I think we tend to view our world fairly simply. God is good, and he gets all the credit for the good stuff. The devil is bad, and he gets all the blame for the bad stuff. And there's this constant battle back and forth between good and evil. Sometimes the good wins, sometimes evil. But that is not a biblical way of understanding our world. The worldview that the Bible presents is that God is sovereign. God reigns completely over everything. Nothing happens without his permission. And even that which we see as evil is under God's sovereignty. See, God says, I will gather the nations who oppress the people. So why the suffering and pain if God is really in control? Well, this is a huge question for which I obviously do not have all the answers but I have a suggestion of one, and that is that the suffering is temporary. The suffering is a temporary necessity bringing a much greater result. See, our perspective is that no pain is best. God's is that suffering is temporary, and the result at the end is better than at the start so it's worth it. Yes, I just said that suffering and pain is worth it. Perhaps the best example is Jesus. He did not want to suffer. He wasn't looking forward to the pain of the cross. He prayed, Lord, I'd rather not go through with this. Isn't there some other way? Yet not my will but yours. We find that in Matthew 26. And in that phrase, we find our best response when we suffer. Not my will, but yours, Lord. See, we may not see why. We may not understand. We may feel hurt and sorrow and anger and confusion and that is the very best time to respond with faith, not my will. And Lord, I choose to believe that through this suffering will come the best you have for us yet. And I believe that this sorrow will last for the night, but joy will come in the morning. And when we, when we get all of that, we understand this apocalyptic literature like Zechariah 14. See, God saves. And in verses 3 through 11, God does come. He does save. He does fight and win and redeem. 
And, that, and that's the message of verses 3 through 11. So then the Lord will go out to fight. See, he places his feet on the mountaintops and he pushes them aside to create an escape route for his people. When their backs are against the wall, God jumps down, stands between his people and their enemy, and because God is standing there in the midst of his people, there will be light everywhere. And it won't be coming from the sun or the moon. Day and night will cease to exist. The light will be from God. And God will be king over all. And the great city of God will be restored and safe and full forever. And that's not the end. See, God does deal with his enemies. So now the story turns to the enemies, and it talks about a plague which will strike the enemies and affect every living thing, including their livestock. It's quite descriptive. It's quite terrible. I mean, if I think about this in a movie, it's like zombie stuff. The movies I would never watch. I'm not drawn to melting faces um, and rotting tongues and eye sockets and like I but I have a very vivid imagination as you can tell but imagine this from the point and view of the Israelites they still have this fresh memory of being treated at the hand of their enemies to them this sounds like justice like they got what they deserved they likely would have rejoiced. So then we have this surprise in verse 16. So here, imagine the Israelites, they are extremely happy to hear that their enemies are going to get it. They, they're, they're gonna like this news, okay? You were mistreated, I am going to give them a taste of their own medicine, yay, justice, and then, Verse 16, then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem, so enemies, will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. Whoa, wait, what? Pause. Let this sink in for a second. The enemies become part of of the community. They get to join in worship. They get to come to the biggest and best party, like the national camping trip, the um, what's our big celebration, Thanksgiving dinner, or 4th of July barbecue, like where the whole community gathers together, our pancake breakfast in the parking lot. So now imagine the Israelites. They've just been told, like, okay, they're going to get it. I'm going to give it to them. But then they're going to be included as part of us. See, isn't this the heart of the good news? That there is redemption for even the worst offenders who turn to God there is reconciliation and forgiveness and restoration, and human relationships are no longer marred by past hurts, but instead joined together in unity, together in worship, focused not on each other, focused not on the past, but instead focused on the King, the Lord of heaven's armies, all the nations together, joining together in worship. So this is actually the day of the Lord, the final hope of humanity, this great conclusion to this apocalyptic vision of how things are really going to end when God comes and fights and wins and makes everything right in the world. But the chapter doesn't end on that note of victory. There's one more thing. Of course there is. Of course there's one more thing. 
Verse 20, on that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like sacred bowls in front of the altar and every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. We need a little bit of background for this to make any sense at all. So during the time of the temple, there are certain pieces that were especially important and they were set apart. And these were set apart for exclusive use in temple worship. So for example, there were priestly garments, special altars, special bowls and basins, and these were only permitted to be used during this formal worship and usually only the priests were allowed to touch them. So this is where we get our word holy. It means set apart exclusively for God. So that's what holy means, set apart exclusively for God. And so with that background, look at this verse again. On that day, suddenly, all the mundane things, bells on horses, pots for cooking, all are now holy. All are now set apart. All of life is now holy and sacred for God. But there's also this transition, and that is before that day, there were special pots, the regular ones, and the ones used for worship in the temple. So now all of that changes. No longer is there regular, secular, everyday use stuff and sacred and holy and only priests can touch. No, now it's you have two separate cupboards and now you take out the divider and you put everything together and you mix it all up and you don't tell a difference between what was for the priests and what was for the bells on the horses. It's all mixed in together. There's no longer this bit is for God and the rest is for me. It's all for God. And this is where I'd like to apply this chapter this morning. Have we segregated our lives? Are we living a double life, inconsistent, compartmentalizing our faith into one corner of life while living something completely different in another corner? Or are we all mixed up and it's all together where God is in all and he's through all, where we are truly set apart for God, where he is welcomed in every part of our life, and we're glad for it. I suspect that for some of us, there are some changes that could be made. Perhaps a need to recommit, a surrender to surrender every part, to decide again to seek first the kingdom of God to live a life consistent with what God's asking us to do every day, putting Jesus at the center and enjoying God to the full. I was trying to figure out what's the best way to conclude our study of Zechariah. And I think the most fitting way for us to conclude Zechariah and to start a brand new year would be for us all to recommit to making God the center of our lives. Because really, that is the theme of the whole book. It began with the cry of God, return to me and I will return to you. And it's carried through the entire book. And it comes to this final, here in chapters 12 through 14, with this glorious picture very vivid picture of the end time when God makes right every wrong and brings a final and lasting peace. 
So this invitation, this cry of love, this hope of justice calls to us today. It calls to us to respond, to love in return, to commit our lives to justice until that day when God finally comes and brings complete justice. So do you hear the call? And how are you going to respond? Do you hear God saying, what about this part of your life? What about this part? Is there any area in your life that you need to turn over to God? Is there something that you've kept hidden, past, present? Let's take a few moments asking and expecting the Holy Spirit to speak to each of us. Listen to the call. How are you responding? Let's take a moment to just allow the Holy Spirit to reveal this to us. And then I'll pray and the worship team can come forward. Lord God, we desire for you to be glorified in our lives. We recognize that there are areas that we could be better in. We could do a better job of glorifying you. So Lord, as you've revealed different things to different ones of us, I pray that we take this as an opportunity to come together, to recommit our lives to you, to living each day, our everyday, our normal days, our mundane days, set apart for you. That there isn't a compartment that we don't allow you in we give you all of us, the good, the bad, the hurt, the sad, the glad, it's all yours. And so Lord, as, as we heed Zechariah's words and you speaking through him to us today, I pray if there is something we need to surrender that we do so as we seek you first, your kingdom first, as we desire to live a life consistent with your calling. I pray you help us put you first at the center. 
and may you be glorified. Amen. Please rise. And all God's children said, Amen. You may be seated. I want to thank our online family for joining us for worship today. Pray you have a blessed week, a happy new year. And if there is something that you've recommitted or surrendered and you'd like to share that, um, please go ahead and, and message. Um, us and we'll get in touch with you. I'd love to have a conversation with you about that. As we now will adjourn to open worship, um, those present here will have the opportunity to share in person if they would like to. Um, but it's extremely important part of um, the process to be accountable to someone, to name that of which we've surrendered, to, re to name that recommitment. Um, there is something to be said about sharing that with someone else. Um, I can tell you from my experience, when I tell someone I'm going to do something or that I've done something, um, there's an accountability, accountability level to actually follow through with that and to do something with it, where if I don't tell anybody, then if I let that um, go, no one knows, and there's just not that same level. Now, God always knows. But we'd love to walk with you through that. So whether you're here in person or online, uh, we want to journey together. So have a blessed week. <laughs>